Yeah, I'm Dennis Murin uh, here with, uh, with you. So I wanted to start by getting your thoughts on this VIEW conference. What's it like for you to be here? Well, it's wonderful. I've been, uh, they've been trying to get me to come here for like 10 or 15 years or so, and it just the timing never worked out, and it just did this year. So uh, it's to be able to be here and see it, and it's, the enthusiasm of everybody, and the level of talent of everybody here, and the uh, energy of the people that are here is just really contagious. We're in Turin, Italy, and I wanted to get your thoughts on the global nature today of the visual effects business. Well, it seems like effects are getting bigger and bigger, and they're spreading into all sorts of different parts of the world. I think uh, the Middle East is getting into it, you know, and of course China is huge, and uh, I don't know about south of the border that much, uh, but that's probably going to be happening, you know, and way down or maybe in, in South Africa, there's probably some going on. I've got no idea. But um, graphics are popular, and the effects are used to tell stories that you could never tell any other way and that people have not seen before. So it's, and it's more effective, I think, to be able to do a lot of that work close to home, wherever the films are being made. So I think it's very regional. You know, even though that you, if you need to, you can send the stuff out, you know, across the web and have comp uh, companies all over the world do it for the best price. But if you want to do it local and have control on it, of it, wherever you are in the world, you can kind of find people. And there's great work coming out of, uh, coming out of, I think, of Sweden, doing some really good stuff, and probably tons of it that I don't even know where it's coming from. It's good work. When it comes to this conference, a lot of the people in the audience come from high school and college. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts about being able to connect with that next generation of visual effects artists? Well, I think it's important to, to talk to the younger people and for them to sort of hear what us old timers have to say, or very old timers. You know, one of the things I'm talking about is to uh, not become so enamored in visual effects that the goal is to do the visual effects. The goal is how it fits into the project. Whether it's a TV show or a film, that's really what I'm mainly talking about. Not so much VR. That's all a whole different thing. And all the reality and all. But in the in feature films, it's how or television. It's how the audience will respond to the effect. And maybe it shouldn't even be an effect. You know, words, don't just put in all sorts of stuff because you love effects. Think of what's best for the final project. Because the audience then is going to be responding to that. And you don't want to lose the audience, you know. None of us do. So that's sort of what I try to do is it's, 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 there's, there's as much value as not doing an effect as there is doing an effect. Well, it's interesting, even even with uh, the latest uh, Jurassic World, there was a lot of practical and puppetry going on, even though you could do all that stuff digitally these days. Right, yeah, it's true of so many films. And you look at Chris Nolan, and you look at the First Man movie, there's a lot of things that are being done with practical models and everything. Why? Well, they see it. Those, the directors see the difference, you know. They see the accidents. They see the, the fact that you can see an object and see how it you can feel practically the paint on the surface and you can reach out and touch it, which is still really hard and maybe even beyond the capabilities of CG. I don't know if it is or not, but no matter what, the computer graphics stuff is a simplified version of reality. And once the shock of the new wears off, which we have with Jurassic and T2 and all, and it's been a while, that's kind of worn off. Now you have the reality left and you know, it wants to be um, real. And if it looks kind of funny, then it's, I think it takes away from the viewer. Now, if you love effects, that may be what you love. That's what I, me growing up, I loved effects. But as I got older and wiser, I realized it's all, it's all, you know, at, at the, for the sake of the story. And it wants to fit into the story. I wanted to get your thoughts since you have been around from, from the beginning. Uh, we're seeing more and more real-time impacting, and, and, and again, connecting to what you just said about the director not being able to see it, what, what impact do you feel real-time visuals, uh, even the use of video game engine technology from pre to, to actual effects, how do you see that impacting things moving forward? I think the I think there's a, a big plus and a big minus to, to being able to make all the decisions on the set. The plus is obvious. You know, oh, I can see the comp there, and the, you know, the game engines are working terrific, and I can, oh, the angle's better over here, and la di da -di -da and all that. That's a big deal. If you're making a game, great. If you're doing reality, watch out. 
because it still isn't real. That if you're looking at a TV set, you're looking at a simplified version, even though it may be full res on the, on the screen in the comp, it may have all the atmosphere you think is in there. When it's all done, you may look at it on the big screen and it just looks incomplete. It's like the atmosphere isn't, is all moving at the same rate or something. I mean, what I'm getting at is there's so much complexity in nature that you're used to in, in most movies, when you see movies made, that when you cut to the effect shot, you don't want it to look sparse. You know, you don't want to look like it's missing something. And it's too hard for us to even figure out what it is because it, it, nature is so complicated. So I just kind of, in a back to nature kind of approach, I think there's a reason why that's, uh, that's happening with a lot of these directors. And, and then you put all the energy into what is part of the story, which is the, what's happening. You know, like the creature or the or the effect you can't get practically or, or whatever. And that's where your heart and soul goes, not to try to recreate to 80% something that you could have just done, you know, for real. At the same time that you guys have been pushing visual effects over the decades, there has been the growth of gaming from yeah. Pong to what they can do today with with these uh, massive games. How have you seen that influence and do the, do the two... Uh, industries kind of help each other, propel each other forward. Yeah, they're, they're helping each other very much. We're using a lot of game technology on set now to do stuff. And uh, the games are always looking at to films for the imagery on films, at least for the reality, to try to get to that level because it's so, you know, it's so uh, exciting and so fulfilling when you see that, something that looks really real. So I think they're we're working all together well. I think our goals are, are different and I think both are serious problems. Some of the game industry's problem is a lot harder because it's gotta be real time and it could be in any direction and that's like that's like a real tough problem. <laughs> that's <laughs> what the VR people are trying to figure out, right? Yeah, that's yeah, and then you know, it's it's uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's tough. But it's getting better. I mean there's look at the, the money, the billions of dollars are being spent on it right now. You know, on this, and it's, I think it's got a huge future beyond entertainment. You know, for VR, for like teaching and calming people and operations and surgeries or who knows what and traveling or who knows what it's going to be. You know, it's a lot of lot of future. Yeah, there's actually be. there's actually was a panel here talking about how VR is helping people cope with uh, with all kinds of things, including dementia. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So it's it's across the board. Year? Yeah, this year. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, so what, when it, the other area that kind of has a crossover I want to get your thoughts on is performance capture. We're seeing that really uh, explode and be used more and more. And what are your thoughts about how, how that's grown and the role it plays today? I think uh, motion capture, performance capture is just a, it's a, like a no-brainer. I mean, people, if, if you're doing a human shape sort of thing, I, I'm not quite as convinced there is a place for it if it's less human. But it makes sense because humans are so complicated and you don't want one or five or ten animators to try to animate you know, one character. We had enough trouble back in the Casper days doing it with a very simple shape. You get into a human, uh, human performance, you know, you want a mocap thing. The actor's got all that sensibility in him. That's why he's an actor. He's expressing it through his face. He already knows this. He, it's not even expression. He knows why to use the expression, when to use it, how much. Body motion, all, you know, and then you get the guys that have been doing a lot of ape stuff or creature stuff that, that have got, that are now can interpret how they think those characters should look or move. Then, uh, you know, they're way ahead, even of a lot of animators, uh, because the animators can't feel it as much as too, there's too much separation, there's too much separation between the feelings they're getting and then having to put it into the puppet, you know, and a, on a, see, and a, CRT and with a mouse and all that sort of so the mocap just makes total sense for improv you know I think when you get into other types of shapes and creatures I think it's it's an easy fix or an easy solution that may not be may not go anywhere and may not and certainly is not accurate you know you put a different sort of shape thing the whole weight's going to be different in it and it might look like a person pretending to be something else you know so it, it's uh, it, there's no there's no easy answer for anything. Back in the early days, you guys had to really get creative in order to bring movie magic to the screen. Yeah. Having all this processing power and all this technology today, creatively, how do you guys push things forward? Like, what are the challenges today? Well, a lot of the challenges, 
I think they're it's sort of going in the wrong places. They're like, you know, how much fur can we have? And, and you know, can we get the lighting to copy exactly what's on the set, even though on the set the cameraman would have relit everything anyway. You know, you want to take that opportunity to do it. Those things are efficiency things, and, also, and uh, ways actually to maybe make things look in some cases a lot better. But I think that thing, people need to chase the other stuff, not so much the technical, they need to chase the emotion. Like, how do you get the emotion? Is the design right? If, if you're designing a character, what's it like smiling? What's it like frowning? What's it like slightly frowned? What's it like, like where you can't tell, is it curious? Or is it like uh, getting a, sort of a little happy reaction to it? Just look at a human face. You know, look at anybody being interviewed and look at all the expressions going on in their face. You talk to somebody for like 10 seconds and you know that person. And you can pretty much tell when they're telling the truth, when they're lying, how they're feeling about stuff. To try to, to put that into a, into a, uh, a package and say, now we know how to animate. Now we know how to do a face. No way. No way. It's much more complicated. And I think that's, that's where we're trying at ILM. And I think it's important that we all try to get into that level of what you could say is hyper-realism. But it's just realism. You know, as the stuff, as the work is getting more demanding, you know, we need to study it. We need to do it for something that can't be quantified. You can, qu you can quantify sort of how many hairs you want. You can quantify if this data is right. You can quantify that. Emotion you can't quantify. And I think we need to get into this understanding of how emotions are made. Not photo, not chemically in your mind. I mean, how you react to when you look at that picture over there or react to that person and yeah, react to how that person's reacting to what you said. It's super subtle, it's, but it goes on all the time in actors, and it goes on all the time in the real world. And but, but it's not taught anywhere, you know? I can, most people probably wouldn't even understand what I'm saying. I don't even know if I do. But, but I know it's missing, and I know when I see it, that it is, and I always, when I see it in actors, and when I see it in directing, and I see it in writing, and camera work, and all that, it's there. And I think it's very fleeting, but it's magical when it happens. We've seen, uh, including the latest Blade Runner and, and Star Wars, of bringing back, either bringing actors back from, from beyond or making them young again. I mean, yeah. how are things progressing there to get past the issues you just talked about of making them look like they're real? Yeah, there's, there's some good stuff going on, yeah. I mean, how, how close are we? Like, you remember back in the day when people, actors were afraid that they were going to be replaced by digital characters? Right, yeah, right, right. You know, Marlon Brando had his body scanned, too. Uh, uh, I, you know, I don't think that's ever going to happen, but I think that we're going to be better at making people looking younger and older and more affordable. Old is sort of easier, but not really, because if you, if you build the makeup off their faces, then that may not be as good as if they look emaciated. When they're older, and you can't do that. You've got this chip. So anyway, I can't talk too much about it right now because we're working on something. Okay. okay. Well, <laughs> I, I wanted to conclude by asking you what excites you about the future when it comes to visual effects. Oh, it's, it's always what it has been before. Something I haven't seen that I feel, and there's some stuff going on right now that I can't talk about that we're doing at ILM that's really super exciting about it. Um, and I'm not being coy about it, you know, you just, we just can't talk about this stuff. Okay. Have, I'm not quite sure how it's all going to play out either. Uh, but I just want, and I want to see an effort put in to take something to a level, and again, this is not like, this is not data, but take something to an emotional level, where it's, where I'm feeling something that I saw the same subject in three other movies, the same idea in three other movies that didn't move me, and in this film it did. What is different about this moment in this film? And I think that's what all directors and studio heads, everybody want. They want everything to be like that. Music wanted to be, but you know, but you can't figure out what it is. But uh, I think that's that's what I see. When I see that, I can sort of see there's a human soul behind that. It's usually the director, direct. But I think it ought to go down more into the crew. He's the director, the cameraman contributes, the writer contributes, the actors certainly contribute. And so much of the work now in effects is important, super important in the film, that, that we need to understand that and go for the emotion of the shot. And uh, to be part of that, 
for Korea team, not just the expediters of the imagery, not just finishing the imagery, but finishing it with the uh, with the level of uh, of total creativity, you know, based on what everybody else wants, not just taking it over, but you know, what, what's appropriate for the film. And I also wanted to get your thoughts on what's it like, you know, having done Star Wars way back in the day with the holographs, and now having mixed and augmented reality literally bring those characters from Star Wars to life through IM, IM X Lab. I know it's pretty, it's pretty crazy to see what's going on in real time, uh, but it's been 40 years, right? It yeah. makes sense. Come on. We, you know, I still don't, you know, have a hovercraft outside, you know, and uh, it's clunky. And where are these holograms anyway? You know, they're fake holograms. So, anyway, but it's pretty neat to see that.